Well, what, what were some of the finds that Petrie made when he was in the Sinai? Petrie's work in the, in the Sinai is incredibly important um, for a number of reasons, but in particular he uncovered uh, a group of inscribed objects, inscribed with a script which um, was unknown elsewhere in Egypt. Um, this is the uh, proto-Sinaitic script. And of course, textual material which Petrie and others were un uncovering in Egypt was, was abundant, but in, written in scripts which, which we're, we're very familiar with, hieroglyphic, um, hieratic, demotic. This was something very different, something very other, um, and something perhaps which um, suggested straight away a connection with uh, cultures outside uh, Egypt. Um, of course, Sinai is, is um, a land that sits in between the Nile Valley, which is the, the heartland of the pharaohs, um, and the lands to the east uh, into Palestine, Canaan. Um, and so, you know, this region, we, we, we knew by this point, was very important as a sort of bridge between those two lands, those two cultures. And what he had found there was perhaps the evidence that um, there was a written culture in that area, which was neither one we were familiar with, was an Egyptian, and, and not Egyptian. Yeah. So something new came forward with that inscription. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's certainly what what Peter was finding here uh, was was new. This this was a new script, um, a new language, something that that very much sat outside what was well established as something Egyptologists knew about in the Nile Valley. In, in, in Sinai, he made, he was so bright that he immediately understood what, is, was, what he was holding. Mm -hmm. yeah. He said, this is an alphabet inscription, it's, it's a strange, but uh, somehow, he, first of all, he, he couldn't decipher it. The decipher was the great, great uh, English Egyptologist Alan Gardiner, 1916, and Petrie had a kind of down-looking way on things and he, he called it even the barbaric the barbaric in, inscriptions that oh, he, he found. Did. Barbaric yeah. Yeah. inscriptions. And another point that I, I never fail to to remind people is that actually the the inscriptions that were found around the caves, around the mines where these people were working and writing, were found by his wife, Hilda Petrie. Mm -hmm. She was also an Egyptologist and she picked it up and she gave them to him and then the whole story started. Yes. Well, I know that uh, they started finding these, you know, uh, what do you call them, proto cyanatic Is that uh, sure. symbols all around? They, call, they gave it the Sinaitic because it was in the Sinai. Is that correct? Right. Uh, Serbian al Khadim is in the Sinai, and so often this writing system that we refer to, I refer to as early alphabetic. Some people use the term Canaanite because initially uh, Serbian al Khadim uh, in the Sinai was the place where the first ones were found. That script was quite understandably referred to as proto cyanatic We know there's something there that uh, is kind of a transition between uh, the Egyptian hieroglyphic signs and then the kind of uh, monoliteral, uh, you know, one, one sign equals one sound, which became the basis for the alphabet. Phonetic, you mean? Yeah. And so uh, we have, throughout the sign, you had workers from the land of Canaan, I think some could have easily been Israelites. That's not, you know, that's d disputed, but how do you determine what's Canaanite and what's Hebrew at this stage? Uh, and they developed this and wrote these inscriptions. When you think about the ability to create words, the ability to have words and communicate ideas, that's a very powerful tool. And uh, the idea that the, where the alphabet came from, uh, is there any new work that you know of uh, concerning the alphabet? Well, the traditional ideas of the Phoenicians gave us uh, the alphabet, and probably the true alphabet we have did come through them. But certainly it goes back much further than that. Now, Doug Petrovich has done a more controversial work uh, using, in my opinion, uh, some of the clear text and coming to a decision that the original uh, alphabet, original language was actually Hebrew. Is there a connection between the Semitic language of, uh, in other words, I know that uh, the Israelites were Semitic people, 
and the question about uh, if they were in captivity in Egypt, was there any connection to their influence on this hieroglyphic system? Well, five or ten years ago, I would have told you I have no idea. But I stumbled into evidence of Israelites in Egypt at the very time when the Bible says, and where biblical chronology says, the Israelites uh, were about to leave at the time of the Exodus. And that evidence launched me into a study of whether or not there's evidence for the 430 year sojourn, the 430 years of living in Egypt that it describes in Exodus 12, 40 and 41. And in stumbling into that evidence, that's where I came to understand that it was Hebrews who wrote the world's oldest alphabetic script. How could you, how did you make that connection? I made that connection as the result of a study um, that I had done on some of these inscriptions. And, and really, it, it all came from finding evidence of Israelites of Joseph's day who were living in Egypt in the form of epigraphical evidence. And that means written inscriptions in Middle Egyptian, in hieroglyphic, that identify Joseph, his two eldest sons, Manasseh and then Ephraim, and one of Manasseh's obscure sons that you only read about in Joshua 17. I have a problem because that's uh, not the reading of these texts. In other words, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh are not mentioned in these inscriptions. Joseph isn't mentioned in these inscriptions. And so it's just not plausible to contend that they were the inventors of the alphabet and that these texts hail from those circles. I wish that we could say that. The difficulty, of course, is that if we say the, these are uh, references to Ephraim and Manassas, uh, uh, and yet we have Egyptian names used for them, not the Hebrew names that we know them by, uh, there's a missing link, as it were, and that link's not there. In other words, the way it works in the field of ancient languages is that positions have to be based in the evidence in a very secure and decisive manner. Does the language that, that's this oldest language, does it look like Egyptian characters or, or is it similar to or, or what's the difference? So Middle Egyptian hieroglyphics of the day in the 19th century BC and Middle Egyptian um, has about roughly 800 or so hieroglyphic signs. Um, and of course the alphabetic script is much more simplistic. So what happened was early Israelites were the ones who invented the alphabet by taking 22 from among the 800 or so hieroglyphs and they used them to create an alphabetic script. So 22 consonants were formed using the pictographs and a pictograph is a pictorial representation in writing of something. And of course hieroglyphics it's all based on pictures. And now we have enough examples to show us. So does it look like there's different, these are actually representing different letters or these different are, forms of a letter? These are forms of the letter from different inscriptions. This is Wadi Ohol 1's ex example of, a, of this letter, Wadi, Ol, Wadi Ohol 2's example. So the fifth column represents the Hebrew proto-consonantal letters. That's the first alphabetic consonants as they existed in the Middle Kingdom during the lifetime of Joseph and just a little bit after. Well, that uh, some of the signs derived from Egyptian signs, yes, that, uh, that's long been, well, I won't say known because it's not been proven. Mm -hmm. But uh, you do have uh, certain signs like the wavy line uh, for, what would it be, meme, I suppose. Mm -hmm. and um, The house, I think. The, yeah, and pair, yes, for bait and what. Uh, um, but uh, now they have been pressed into service for a West Semitic uh, language, not for an Egyptian one uh, or for any Egyptian dialect. <coughs> um, I would like to have evidence of the existence of a Joseph. For me, the Joseph that I know exists only in the story. Uh, if there was a Beit jo Yosef, a house of Joseph, uh, that kind of uh, term does go back to a real ancestor. 
I mean, the Bnei Yisrael, the sons of Israel. I'm sure Israel was a real character, and Yaakov as well. And uh, Jacob. Uh, Jacob, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, I have no difficulty with that. Um, but it's just that outside the Joseph story, uh, I don't see a real Joseph anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, the, well, the, you mean the Joseph that was the the prime minister of Egypt that solved the problem? That's right. And e even some of the details uh, the uh, about uh, Egyptian life and culture uh, from the Joseph story suggests that late period of writing. Okay, when now, you say the late period, give people a date. Okay, uh, well, in terms of Egyptian history, the Sayite period, which would be 664 down to the coming of Alexander, something like that. Okay, about 300 so, BC. Yeah, so, right. something like that. So it's, it is really uh, the late period of Egypt's independence. Um, and there were a number of uh, plot motifs that uh, circulated in the literature of the time and, and the folklore of the time. Up until now, scholars have told us there was no Hebrew language that was in place for the Law of Moses to have been written between 1446 and 1406 BC. But now with the discovery of these inscriptions that go all the way back to 1840 BC, when the first inscription, Hebrew inscription. Back, uh, back to the time of Joseph. To the time, the days of the Joseph was alive. Since we now know that that written script existed, we can infer that for hundreds of years, it was already in use among the Hebrews before Moses even came onto the scene. There's been a criticism that it says that Moses could not have written uh, the Bible because he didn't have the ability to write at the time of the Exodus. He had the ability because he was a prince of Egypt. He was educated. He would have been educated in reading and writing ancient hieroglyphs. Well, he didn't have the ability to write Hebrew, right? Uh, well, no, he did, you see. This is the point. With these inscriptions, these proto scientific inscriptions, we have an alphabet now at the time that I would put Joseph and Moses. In other words, that era is when this comes into being for the first time. So if Joseph, for instance, was the person who invented this method of writing the Semitic language as a script, Moses would have learned that very easily and very quickly. And that would have been the form of writing that he would use to write the narrative of the Exodus journey, the laws of the, of the Israelites that would be, you know, handed down. Whoever it was that wrote the Torah was familiar with Egyptian culture. Uh, for example, the name Moses, uh, it sounds awfully similar to Tutmosi, Amosi, those are Egyptian names. It sounds very similar to that. Whoever wrote the Torah was familiar with Egyptian culture, with topography of the area, uh, uh, behaviors, norms, and other things. So you have an individual who was familiar with uh, Egyptian life at that period. And here's another example. Semitic languages uh, at the time that this one was originally alleged to have been written and that I believe it was written, they didn't use a definite article. What's example. a definite article? Uh, whenever we try to make something specific or definite in English, I might say the magnifying glass as opposed to a magnifying glass. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking about one particular. In Hebrew, you have a definite article that goes back to the time uh, the 1400s BC. None of the other Semitic languages had that at that time, but Egyptian did. And it's only uh, to be expected that Hebrew would have developed the use of that particular grammatical form because of the interaction of the Hebrews with the Egyptians of the day. So there's uh, the, the, the use of the right. uh, in front of com defining something. Right. What's unique about Sinai 377 as an inscription? Sinai 377 represents what I know to be the oldest Hebrew alphabetic inscription in existence. Uh, if we take this image now and take away the photo, this is what it would look like if it's just the letters on here. Well, so we have two inscriptions side by side, intricately bound, Sinai 377 in Hebrew, Sinai 46 in Middle Egyptian. At the top, in what's called the lunette is the year date. Hmm. Then the name of the king is given here hmm. and that locks it in place chronologically. So this Middle Egyptian inscription is connected to this inscription because of how the two stelliforms are formed, made to be as part of one, 
And we know that, that it's connected because we have the same breaking down of the stone here in this place as we do here in that inscription. So it's uniformly worn down over time. What date were the inscriptions at the Sinai mines? And how do we know? Right, uh, that's, uh, that's a debated point. Most people argue that they hail from the Middle Kingdom. Uh, both the inscriptions from Serbid al Hadam and those from Wadi al Hol are in essence argued to be Middle Kingdom. Usually we posit that they date to around 1800 BCE. One of the reasons we do that is because, for example, at Wadi al Hol, the inscriptions that are closest are actually Middle Kingdom texts, mm -hmm. and the same is true for the Serbian inscriptions. Yeah. The difficulty is that just because there are inscriptions close, it, uh, Northwest Semitic inscriptions close to hieroglyphic inscri inscriptions or hieratic inscriptions, one can't assume that they must have been put there at the same time. Is this one of the very first inscriptions that show you that there's a Semitic connection to ancient Egypt? Yes, and if we um, look at this inscription, now it gives you a full showing of the Okay. Uh, the stella form. And then if all of this is drawn in, which I did uh, with computer generation, you take away the photo and this is what you're left with. These two inscriptions are connected. The Hebrew inscription reads malal ofe, which the verb comes first and then comes the subject. And it's saying the baker has inscribed, and that's it. It doesn't say what he inscribed, but the implied uh, direct object of what he inscribed is this stella, this stelliform mm -hmm. inscription. So it's almost like graffiti in a sense that if you were going out to a park and you went deep into the park and you found a beautiful stone there, you could write, Tim Mahoney was here. It's similar to that in that the, the baker is saying, the baker has inscribed this inscription, and that's all. And once this thing was, was invented, one should remember, it, there were no schools, there were no institutions, there were, nobody was interest, interested in this, excuse me, ugly, I don't want to say ugly words here, but it was considered. It did have the beauty of, of uh, let's say, yeah, Egypt. Yeah, and it's, it's so Hieroglyphs. ugly. Have you seen it? How yes, ugly have, it is? Yeah. One, one, one is big, but one letter is big and one is small and yeah. they look different. And so it was a kind of a secret script or something that ran away between, it, it, among these this simple people, the miners, the soldiers, the, uh, all the people that ran around, all the Canaanites that were running around in, yeah. in, in between Egypt and, and uh, Sinai and, uh, and uh, Canaan in this period, you know, Canaanites were moving around all the time. Mm -hmm. And they could write their names. This is what you needed it for. You, you would like to write your name, yeah. especially to, to leave it for the gods, you know, it's very important. This inscription is telling you the time of the potential relationship of all. Exactly, the time that both of them were written. And what it's telling you is that the Hebrew writer of Sinai 377 and the Egyptian writer of Sinai 46 were on friendly terms with each other. They had some kind of important connection between them. It's hard to read this text too, isn't it? These texts are difficult to read. And part of the reason it's difficult to read them is because the people writing them were writing on surfaces that uh, weren't perfect for writing. Sides of <laughs> sides of rocks. That's or right. Caves, right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Or statuary, and so in the case of some of the Serbian inscriptions, of course, as well. That's a better surface, but have you ever tried to go into a cave and write anything? I don't know if it's allowed, but mm. it's not easy to scratch uh, necessarily, depending on what you mm. have. I mean, it's not easy to leave a mark. That's right, and I suppose that uh, what I would then note the obvious, uh, someone's attempt to state that they can not only read these inscriptions, but read names that we know from the Bible, or posit that we have people uh, present in these inscriptions from the Bible. It's a difficult thing indeed, and it, to, to use an expression that uh, we sometimes use in the South, that dog won't hunt. In other words, you just can't do that. You have to have evidence for these proposals, and uh, it's just not there. You are building a case that Joseph and his sons, uh, Ephraim and Manassas, were really the 
uh, the originators of this early Semitic language, the, the written part of it. This would have, been, would have been transferred through the generations then of the Hebrews in Egypt? Would they have been learning this? I think that uh, the fact that we see Middle Kingdom inscriptions from 1840 BC, um, 1834 BC, 1831 BC, 1772 BC, we see these Middle Kingdom inscriptions in perfect form of Hebrew, and then we see it in the New Kingdom in, in roughly 1480 to 1446. That shows a great continuity over those hundreds of years that even though the script itself uh, worsened in the sense that it became um, more abstract, less pictographic, and thus less beautiful. Nonetheless, all of the important elements of language were maintained. Uh, that's going to be disputed by most scholars simply because uh, in his determination and in his translations, he's found uh, people and characters and things related to uh, Israel's history which they don't like them because of where they're dated. It pushes it back to the 15th century uh, BC and they're not comfortable with that particular dating system for some of these things. And, uh, but nevertheless, it's, it's a seminal work that needs to be investigated and carefully read.